out west as we go to District 5 uh, for the Howard County Council. Many of you that have perhaps watched this before or if you are new to this, we have uh, spoken to uh, candidates in the downtown Columbia area. We've uh, spoken to candidates out in the Ellicott City area. Um, in addition, we will be speaking to uh, candidates for the General Assembly as we start going later into the months of September and, and October. And so this is all about just bringing you information. Uh, the chamber, for those of you that perhaps don't know, we do not endorse candidates. We do take positions on issues and, and the like. And so we will advocate for or against an issue, but we never advocate for or against a candidate. And so, um, so again, this is really about bringing information to you. And so, again, we're excited to have with us Joan Pontius with us, as well as David Youngman. And so each candidate will have a couple of minutes or so to uh, answer the question. And we will take turns in terms of who goes first and who goes second um, and spend roughly about maybe 50 minutes or, or so, um, you know, just talking about issues relevant to Howard County. And so with that, we're going to get started and I'm going to, um, uh, the candidates have been notified that we're doing it alphabetically. And so P comes before Y. And so Joan will get us started. And so the first question for her is just ultimately just sharing a, for uh, Joan, for you to share a little bit about yourself in, in terms of background experiences and ultimately why you want to serve on the county council. And Joan, let me uh, let me meet you here. There you go. Yeah, I, uh, my husband and I have lived in Howard County 23 years. We moved to Maryland for my job as an analyst at the NIH. And we moved to Howard County for its green spaces. Uh, we're in District 5 and we love the rural area next to its great location. Um, over the years, I've been concerned about the residential development um, and the increased commercial use and various land use issues. Uh, I retired three years ago. Um, by then I was starting to do project management um, along with my uh, analytical skills. And this spring, the Progressive Democrats of Howard County uh, approached me asking me to run um, for county council. And this was interesting to me um, because I saw a, a sharp contrast between me and the representation from, uh, from David. Um, and if I could be a vote on the county council for, um, for, for representing the residents instead of so much commercial interest, so much residential development, I, th I thought I might be able to um, make a difference for the residents of Howard County. So this spring, I declared my candidacy. I'm a publicly funded campaign meaning I do not take donations from um, developers or real estate interests or any PACs. All my donations come from residents and only $250 a resident. This year is the first year for the Citizens Election Fund, so I get matching funds, and those just came through this week. So I actually have a, a competitive budget to be in this campaign. Um, in talking to residents, they're in District 5 especially, they're very supportive of preserving our agricultural base and our forests and our open spaces. Uh, my three priorities are land use issues and preservation, uh, representing the residents instead of special interest, and fiscal responsibility and spending since our taxes have been gone up. When I came here, we had the lowest taxes in the county, and now we're the highest. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to the race. I don't have a background in as a... Um, a politician. I'm an analyst. Um, I'm retired so I can work full time and I'm eager to learn about the county issues and how I can help the residents of Howard County. Thank you, Joe. Next, we will turn things over to uh, David Youngman, who is a current uh, county council member representing this area. And so, David, if you would, uh, for those that may not know you well, share a little bit about your background and, you know, desire to continue and ultimately why you want to continue serving uh, in District 5. Um, so let's see, I've been here 50 years, went through public schools, grew up in the Valley in Chatham and Mount Hebron. 
I've changed careers a few times. Uh, the last 20 years, I've been out in Woodbine where my kids grew up, went to Glenelg High School. Um, my service started sort of organically. Um, you know, you coaching and PTA and boosters and, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and then just somehow grew into being a PTAC delegate and some other, you know, like the next step higher type things, leadership, um, got involved in some zoning opposition, um, served on a bunch of nonprofit boards, including the chamber board for several years. Um, and then the stars just sort of aligned. I was looking for how to you know, kind of take my my public service and community service to the next level. Uh, my kids were six months from <laughs> leaving me in, as an empty nester, and um, and this council seat was was available. So um, that's um, I decided to to run back in 2017 and uh, and was elected. Um, it, you know, I think that our priorities. I think the important thing about elected officials and politicians to talk about priorities is all about balance. Um, you know, you're going to hear over and over again in this um, campaign that, you know, I'm the guy that cares about business to the detriment of residents. And um, that's just spin. And, um, you know, caring about business and caring about residents is not mutually exclusive because businesses are our neighbors and citizens and our small businesses and business owners and places where we all work and places where we all shop and provide us the services and things that we need to live here are all part of this interconnected web of what makes a community, what makes a society or a village. Um, I mean, we've helped hundreds of residents um, in the most overlooked part of the council job is constituent service is helping small you know, with residents and small businesses with their issues. So um, I enjoy doing it and hope that I can continue to be the person on the council that tries to bring everybody together um, for some sensible solutions. Thank you, David. And so with that, we're going to start with you on this uh, next question. And, and so both, you know, certainly you and Joan um, in your beginning comments both spoke you know, about interest in terms of zoning and land use and, and so forth and development. So we're going to start there. And so uh, this first question is really going to talk about um, the general plan. And so once each decade, Howard County updates its general plan, which is a long range visionary document that guides land use, growth and development decisions. In your opinion, what should this document prioritize as it relates to neighborhoods, employment centers, and overall planning themes? Um, I'm going first, Leonardo. I'm first, yes. right? Yes. I'm sorry, yes. I just didn't want to sorry. butt in. I, I muted, um, yeah, I muted myself too it's, soon. It's okay. Um, you, you know, we, the, it, for for generations, a couple of generations, Howard County has has been dependent and, and unhealthily dependent on residential growth um, for economic development, for jobs, to balance the budget and 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 the whole litany. And in this general plan, and I think you're hearing it from a lot of us on the council, we absolutely must for the first time be serious about how to wean ourselves off of this dependence on residential growth. We've talked a lot at the chamber and we've talked a lot publicly and even in the last campaign um, that residential growth, you know, while, while it increases the revenue stream, it also increases costs a lot. And um, where we have fallen down is commercial development. I mean, there's been a, million million tries to get route one going and you know downtown columbia is falling behind and you know, there's just there's these natural employment centers where we can grow our tax base without um you know without bringing on all the all the um follow-on service costs of residential development um we we have to also focus on maintaining existing neighborhood character um 
you know, there's some parts of this general plan already that concern me a lot as far as dynamic neighborhoods and things. If you live there, I'm not sure you want it to become dynamic. Um, you know, build out our already kind of in process um, mixed use and employment centers downtown, Maple Lawn, et cetera, expand agriculture businesses. Um, I just, I, I think that's our two minute thing. So when I hear that, I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. So you don't have to tell me to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, Joan, the uh, same question for you. And, and again, I'll just repeat it. And, and it pertains to the general plan, which, again, is a long range visionary document that guides land use, growth and development decisions. In your opinion, what should this document prioritize as it relates to neighborhoods, employment centers and overall planning themes? It said our county's been prioritizing too much on residential growth and it hasn't paid for itself. So for the long term, a sustainable plan, we need growth that balances the needs of our neighborhood and the preservation of our environment. We need to strengthen the adequate public facilities ordinance so that it requires that infrastructure is in place before we get new residential properties. We can't continue to keep putting in more residential properties without adequate schools, roads, but also fire rescue, and hospitals. Um, the general plan in Howard County by design has no section on schools. We need a plan to have schools located near walkable neighborhoods and to have their employees, not only the teachers, but the staff able to afford to live near their work. The business section of Howard County by design does not include an analysis of income disparities, which have become exaggerated over the past decades. With COVID, we've seen the importance of essential workers who we often take for granted. Uh, we need to support a living wage for all employees and strengthen our middle class. Um, the next 10 years will be unique and that we'll be transitioning away from fossil fuels as energy sources. We'll be facing extreme weather events from climate change and we need to be prepared for um, the possible pandemics continuing, for example, monkeypox. So we need flexibility in adjusting to these unique circumstances that are coming our way, as well as learning from past uh, mistakes. Thank you. And so we're going to stay uh, uh, somewhat on, on the land use, and, and you touched on a little bit about APFA. And for those, again, that are watching and you know, maybe you're trying to understand exactly what is APFO. It is the, uh, it's an acronym for the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance. And so um, I'll give you a little homework and let you actually look it up and spare you the, uh, <laughs> the details of discussing further here. But uh, so Joan, this question goes to you uh, first. And so in 2018, the County Council passed an Adequate Public Facilities, facilities Ordinance that many believe would stall and slow future development. The Department of Planning and Zoning data reflect, does reflect a slowdown in development permits being submitted. And so this is kind of a multi-part question. So based upon the fiscal pressures facing the county, do you think this legislation should be revisited during the next council term? And if so, what would be the objectives of any revisions you would pursue? Um, yeah, so slowing down residential growth is a benefit in, um, in looking at the county's long-term expenses because the new residential growth is, is costly, the costly infrastructure and services. Um, the goal of APFO, the Adequate Public Facilities, requiring that we have facilities before these residences going in, um, was supposed to allow time for schools to be constructed so that new development would not produce overcrowded schools. But this clearly isn't working. We have overcrowded schools, the students, we have 200, over 200 portables in the schools and new trailers are being bought every year. So in my opinion, APFO needs to be expanded um, to be more stringent with respect to schools and roads. It needs to include hospitals and emergency services, fire and rescue, sewage, Stormwater management. Um, 
Yeah, and that's it. Your on the, your written question, you mentioned um, affordable housing. Oh, I can't hear you anymore. I know. I'm sorry. I'm I didn't. Sorry. I, I decided to stop it just because I, I didn't want to give so much into that question that you know you were trying to uh, to figure out. Okay, like where do I start or what have you? But certainly, feel free to go into the follow up, which is, um, and we're going to ultimately dive into economic development. But and, and so we're going to pause here and I'm going to go to David and we're going to come back and talk okay. about economic development. Yeah. But so, to summarize, uh, I would support yes. um, strengthening APFO. Definitely. Okay. okay. And so, David, the same question, um, you know, a, a, again, just based upon the, actually, let me stop this. Based upon the fiscal pressures facing the county, do you think the APFO legislation that we currently have should be revisited during the next council term? And if so, what would be the objection, the objectives of any revisions you would pursue? And hold on one second, David, I'm sorry. Simplistic answer is no, as far as revisiting it. Can you hear me? Or did I mute myself? Okay. Um, you know, as far as revisiting, because I, I think that continuing to revisit APFA, which is a 30 year old sort of philosophy or mechanism, um, might just be continuing to beat our heads against the wall. Um, what I'm hoping is there's a new mousetrap out there that's, that, that some jurisdictions are using that do a better job. APFO, you know, look, we can, we can go all over the county and find places where it has slowed development until a school could catch up and places where it has it. One of, obviously, the main flaws of it is, is you can't get a school built in four years. Um, so, you know, again, short answer, no, when revisiting APFO and let, until somebody brings us the new APFO, the thing that works better, that we look at a county or a jurisdiction and say, they've got it, this figured out, it's time to update how we do things. Um, and I do agree that, you know, the roads, we don't even talk about the roads test and that's part of APFO. And there's so many, there should be so many other things that are part of APFO too, that, um, you know, have crept up on us. Um, you know, it, it's um, again. Th this is this is one of those political footballs that people like to toss around and really oversimplify. And 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 it's not. It's just not that simple. Um, you know, and I think we need to again look to read to commercial development to make up for some of this contraction and residential development that's happened. You know, while we try to figure APFO out. <laughs> And so that's a good segue into this next question, which is going to talk about economic development. And so ultimately, you know, share your vision for ultimately how you would foster an economic environment, you know, that leads to job creation, private investment, and and, and obviously at the same time that will create even, I, I know we've talked about housing on the one hand, having too much of it, but yet also you know, as we grow commercially, we still have to have places for people to live and in particular from an affordable housing standpoint. So kind of share your thoughts in terms of job creation, but yet balancing it also to create affordable housing as well. Um, me this time? Yes, yes, you first. Okay. Um, you know, I, this is, I, I, I know people cringe sometimes when I say this, but you know, I, I do not buy into this notion that just because you live in Howard County, the taxpayers have a responsibility to subsidize your ability to live here. Okay, if I worked in lower Manhattan, I might be living in New Jersey. If I worked on Capitol Hill, I might be living in Greenbelt. Okay, until we have dozens of companies lining up telling us that they can't come here, they can't stay here, they have to move away because their workers don't have a place to live. You know, I think there's a lot of other motives that feed this whole narrative of needing thousands of new affordable housing units. But as far as, you know, generating economic activity and economic growth, I mean, look, everybody that buys into this new growth scenario, you know, look at Connecticut and other places like government never contracts. OK, you don't grow a little bit. Your taxes are going to go through the roof and the cost of living here is going to get even worse. But we're, what we're good, trying to do to break this reliance on residential development is to focus on a stronger commercial tax base. We're forming a work group to, to go through a list of the regulations and policies that create headwinds for that and incentivize 
uh, private development, the administration, EDA representatives are going to be part of that. EDA has got to have better tools. We got a million bucks in private money into their fund to do property consolidation down on route one. It's such a big, you know, that's a big issue down there to help them bring in some larger, um, some, some larger businesses. And, and, and frankly, I personally, I just, we need to stop pursuing the litany of legislation that comes out that's been coming out of this council of administration that result in private investment employers and jobs going other places, which just leaves us further reliant on residential development. Thank you. So next, uh, Joan, uh, same question for you this time. Yeah, so how I would foster an economic environment that leads to job creation and private investment. So first, I would ask, what's the goal of this job creation and how the jobs serve the community? Um, Howard County already has some of the lowest unemployment in the state and even the country. So would these jobs be for our current residents or are they going to attract new residents, new employees to the county? Um, and then we would need to build residential properties for them. So the model of looking to residential development as a source of revenue is, has not uh, panned out because of the high costs of the infrastructure to support them. And our taxes are going up, not down. So and we have also seen how rapid growth has led to overcrowded schools, traffic congestion, and the loss of open spaces. So economic growth with no consideration of the social consequences and the environmental impact is not sustainable. We need a stable environment for the businesses, not one where stores in Ellicott City uh, get wiped out by stormwater runoff or where families move here and um, realize their children are being taught in trailers. We need economic growth balanced by the social and environmental considerations. We need to preserve what makes Howard Can County special and what's drawing, um, what's keeping people attracted to Howard County and in District 5, that is especially its open spaces. On the other hand, we do have residents in Howard County who are struggling to make ends meet. Um, and we have unemployment from the pandemic. So rather than attracting new jobs to the county and new businesses and new employees, my priority would be to see how our workforce could be adjusted to reduce income disparities, the discrepancies in um, the county for its current residents. For example, we have recently increased the minimum wage. This will allow extra income for struggling families to spend more and support the businesses that provide food, clothing, and healthcare services that are important to all of us. Um, and reviewing the county's programs for job, for incentives for job creation, I would want to verify that these programs are contributing to a nurturing environment for the residents here, for their own startups rather than funneling our tax dollars to wealthy, hand-selected special interests from outside the county. Thank you. And so we're gonna stay on economic development. And so economic development and investment are, are predicated on a regulatory predictability whereby the rules of engagement are set and understood by all seeking to do business in a jurisdiction. Howard County has historically been praised for its predictable business environment. Private sector public opinion has waned recently due to the enactment of legislation that at times differs from the state and surrounding counties. Do you feel these sentiments are warranted? How and why? Yeah, I, I had to guess on this question. I'm guessing that it refers to the increase of minimum wage or forest conservation bills regulations related to packaging or plastic bags um, and the adequate public facilities ordinance. Um, I think we need a balanced approach. We need to make sure businesses are getting what they need in Howard County, but we also need to make sure that the employees and the quality of life for all our residents is preserved. So many of our new regulations um, we phase in to allow businesses time to respond. And I am concerned about the business community's perception of Howard County. Um, one reason predictability is impacted is due to poor planning 
And I would advocate for a balanced approach that benefits the community and the businesses. If the community hurts, the businesses hurt and vice versa. Thank you. And David? And so I wouldn't just um, like come out of a cannon on this one. Um, no hesitation, absolutely. Without question, this administration and this county council have perpetuated and I think made worse that reputation for lack of predictability for business and frankly for residents as well. Um, I, I, I think we, we, we used to just follow Montgomery County down the rabbit hole. Now we want to lead them. We want to signal our virtue on things like the environment, climate change that are, you know, then on balanced, sensible policy that addresses some of those, you know, issues on people's mind and quality of life issues. But make no mistake, you shut down economic growth, no one will be afford, be able to afford to live here. We have to remain regionally competitive. We don't have to be more anti-business or anti-growth than Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County, Baltimore County, PG County. They are eating our lunch right now when it comes to economic growth on the commercial side because of, I, I think, part of its reputation and part of its real, you know, not just perception. It shouldn't have been a battle to have the same exceptions to the minimum wage that exist everywhere else in the state. We don't need a rate that goes up higher and faster than Anne Arundel County. We didn't need overreaching forest con laws that further reduce the footprint that we can use to make land productive in a county that already is struggling with tiny parcels that we can't do anything with when our neighboring counties don't have laws that are that stringent. We need to remain regionally competitive. That doesn't mean ignore the environment or not have balanced policy. It just means you need to be competitive with your neighboring counties. Thank you, David. And so you'll go first this time. And, and on that, so ultimately what challenges, you know, so if you're on council, what, you know, again, what challenges do you anticipate coming up in the long term you know, from an economic development standpoint that require a different approach than today? Um, you know, I mean, not to beat a dead horse, and <laughs> I think Joan and I together are beating this dead horse and this reliance on residential development, but it's also how this reliance on residential development combined with um, our, you know, kind of running out of land that's creating a, a, a pretty rapid shift in our demographics. Um, and, you know, not only are we putting pressure on the environment by doing these things, but we are putting incredible pressure on schools, not just from a utilization standpoint, everybody focuses on overcrowding and trailers and things like that, but the sharp increases in students that need a litany of special services is, is, is really forcing the school system to put money into areas that it used to not need to before. And a lot of those areas that are just basic nuts and bolts education of why a lot of people moved here to get that out of the schools is now being underfunded, sort of the average kid. Um, you know, and obviously puts more pressure on social services too, which have always been taxed, I, I imagine. So the big challenge now is how to shift away from this residential to commercial growth in a county with limited land. Um, you know, and, you know, just to just to add one last thing that came up with one of the last responses is this what I'm advocating. And when you hear people talk about isn't creating a job and building someone a house next door to live there. The, the, the point of this is to get the economic growth you need to have a fiscally sustainable model here but not needing to build that house. Just because you work in Jessup doesn't mean I've got to build you a house in Elkridge, you know, and um, other counties have the ability to create that residential development. I want to bring them here to work. And, you know, if they uh, head back to an adjacent county, that's great. Thank you, David. And, and uh, Joan, this uh, question of goes to you. Oops. Um, I agree. We have to rethink the dependence we've been having on residential development. Um, but as far as other long-term 
challenges that are different than today, um, I thought of four. Uh, climate change, changing technology, public health, and supply chain issues. So I think climate change is going to be a huge one, uh, especially in terms of extreme weather events. We've seen the huge impact of stormwater runoff on the destruction of Ellicott City and the shops there. Rainwater is diverted into our streams, giving Howard County awful ratings in terms of the sediment it contributes to the Bay. And yet our county continues to approve more housing projects, more impervious surface, more runoff. This needs to change. Along with storms from extreme weather events, our summers are going to warm up. Uh, the use of air conditioning can lead to brownouts, especially if we start using uh, electric vehicle um, charging stations. We need to rethink energy efficiency. We have homes that are described as being um, energy efficient because of the construction and the materials they use, but they're larger than ever before. Um, and, you know, especially compared to starter homes in the 50s, and our families are smaller. So even public buildings have higher ceilings that require heating and cooling. So I think we need to think of energy efficiency in terms of how much energy is used per capita, not just what material are the buildings constructed out of. We need to adjust for technology advancements. COVID has shown the importance of the internet and having everybody have access to um, internet. We're going to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. We need to make decisions on alternative energy sources such as solar panels and wind turbines. And how will panels and batteries be recycled? These are all gonna be new challenges within the next 10 years. Uh, public health with COVID and now perhaps monkeypox, we need to rethink public safety and how we interact with each other. The use of masks has been a huge issue. Um, we need to think of ways we can all work together to keep each other safe. Um, COVID, ah, COVID, <laughs> and last- Finish supply. your thought, finish your thought. Yeah, so I'll skip to supply chain interruptions because that's relevant to District 5 because we have so much agriculture there. We need to encourage people to grow their own food and we need to encourage the continuation of food production in District 5. Thank you. And and, and so we're going to shift gears and, and, and move a little bit and talk about um, budget and then ultimately education. And so the fiscal year 23 spending affordability report stated that Howard County showed improved revenues during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, this performance was not sustainable due to temporary factors such as extraordinary contribution of federal funding, strong performances by the stock and real estate markets. And the report also talked about, quote, such above historical average growth during a time of unprecedented financial uncertainty, overwhelming health and safety challenges, and massive job loss is counterintuitive and not a reflection of sustainable economic fundamentals, especially as local employment remains well below pre-pandemic levels. So considering that statement, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the county budget and how do you plan to address these fiscal constraints? Yeah, I agree that the um, federal funding for COVID was crucial in minimizing the disruption of the pandemic. And it's appropriate to use those expenses, um, those payments for replacing the incomes of businesses and uh, the salaries of workers that were unable to work. But the, that won't have a long-term effect on the budget. Um, the spending affordability report shows that our predicted expenditures are going to increase um, and exceed revenues. So, um, it's the county executive who puts the budget together. He's going to need to make hard decisions in terms of spending priorities. Um, when I online, you hear when new um, programs come out, and some of them, I I would not prioritize. How did a seventy-five million dollar dinner theater uh, in Columbia get prioritized when we have students in two hundred trailers? <coughs> Why can't that money be used for? Um, a theater school or a, a culinary school for, for our students. Um, the long-term fiscal impact of zoning and land use decisions is important and these haven't been taken into consideration. Residential development is costly and doesn't pay for itself. 
and the county council has to recognize this. Thank you, David. Um, I, I think I said when when we were asked this question before the budget that I would focus on a pre-pandemic growth rate, pay down debt, give some money back to taxpayers, build reserves. But I'll tell you what the budget ended up being was a gross, painful display of election year giveaways to every existing or potential source of a handful of votes. And my fear is the number of people who, and I said this during budget, who will become dependent on a now new or expanded program during this fiscal year, only to have the money disappear next year, or us being forced to now maintain what was supposed to be one-time spending. The use of one -time, um, that one-time money to create these structural commitments is why I voted against, the biggest reason why I voted against the budget. Uh, my fix at a minimum this year will be to amend the heck out of a budget that comes down to, that wants to sustain all of those things that were supposed to be one-time spends and to continue to hammer on needs versus wants, recognizing that no matter how good we are at solving all the things we talk about on this call today, Howard County is maturing and is not going to have the same ability to buy everything that it may have had, you know, in the 80s or 90s. Um, one last thing, because I have a couple seconds, the the funding and complexities of the Howard County Arts and Culture Center are so not misunderstood by folks that refer to it as a $75 million dinner theater and what else could be that money could be used for. Um, we did not take money out of the school system's pocket to build a dinner theater. And so when you, you know, if we want to have a more robust conversation about the complexities of that transaction, which I tabled so I could lead the restructuring of um, to lower the county's cost and risk, um, that I'll, I'm happy to sit down and talk about that in more detail. Sorry, so we're going to stay here and, and kind of it's still budget related, but shift towards education. And so ultimately, you know, we, you know, consistent, we know that Howard County has, has prided itself, you know, historically on education and education funding and, and so forth. Yet, you know, we also hear, as we just talked about, the challenges to the overall budget. And so ultimately, how will you support Howard County's educational standards while balancing the needs of our residents and businesses? And I'm referencing just other needs that we have from a county perspective and, and that we have to pay for. And so how do we budget both education and the other stuff that the county needs? Well, I mean, the easy answer that, well, it's not easy because it's, you know, you still have money limitations, but, you know, we still four years later don't have enough collaboration between the school system, the county executive and the county council. I understand the county council isn't the budget authority, so I would settle for just communication or more collaboration during the year between the administration and the budget office, um, you know, but I, I <laughs> I like to start with a BOE that's not grossly fiscally unskilled and irresponsible. And, you know, that might sound harsh, but not just in its approved budget request that they send to the county executive, which this year was absurd. Um, but just during the year, it's lack of financial oversight and purchasing and spending and how they manage the money they have. There's only one board member, the one from District 1, has any financial background at all. And I, I see us going into this election, getting ready to elect a bunch of people who, again, don't have any fiscal background at all. We focus on society, societal and ideological positions and not fiscal competence or academics. Folks, these are the seven people that manage 60, 55, 60% of your tax dollars and run the system that educates your kids and runs the amenity that maintains our housing values. And yet, look at who we send there to to run that system um, whether we like it or not Kerwin's going to focus us to realign our priorities you know we cannot afford the Kerwin model plus a couple hundred million dollars now that our legislature and the state teachers union 
are setting those priorities, it's going to be harder and harder for us to fund those things that used to set us apart from other counties without bankrupting the county. Um, I don't have the answer. I don't think anybody has the answer as we head into Kerwin. Um, but I can tell you, just spending a couple hundred million bucks over the Kerwin requirements is, is just, it's never going to be possible or sustainable. Thank you, David. And we're going to stay on education for a second. But uh, Joan, uh, just overall, how would you support the county's educational standards while balancing the needs of residents and businesses? I believe this question is about the budget because I, I don't think that educational standards and the needs of residents and businesses, you know, you have to choose one or the other. I think they're very, they're all important and they're interdependent. But it's true that the we we need more schools and they're expensive. And um, in the past, we have reduced the school surcharge on new residential properties. And if this had been increased, maybe we could have afforded the, the new schools to um, accommodate these new residences. So I think one possibility is to start making residential developers pay their fair share of the surcharge and impact fees um, to solve this issue at a systemic level, rather than uh, blaming the Board of Education. So, so we're going to stay here and, and dig a little deeper. and so. You know, so we've, we've heard a little bit of comments about just maybe the, the budget process and, and and so forth. So if you were elected, um, yeah, I guess this is a two part question. One is, do you believe that the Board of Education is using its capital budget responsibly to meet the top needs of schools? And also what changes might you, cons you know, might you consider to the overall budget process that involves the school system? Yeah, um, I think it's important that the Board of Education is in charge of their budget. Um, as far as making a judgment as to whether they've done a good job or not, um, I don't know. I, I'd be interested in learning more about that. Dave has his opinion, and I'd be interested in talking to uh, various stakeholders to see if that's the case. But um, for me, in my position, um, I wouldn't point fingers at this point. I, I would be open to learning more about um, their experience in handling a budget and the struggles that they're having. Fair enough. David? I think they use their capital budget wisely. Um, Prince George's County is in the middle of a P3 um, that's got, I believe, seven or eight um, major capital projects, new schools, replacement schools in the ground. Um, you know, as residential growth in Howard County continues to slow, we can handle um, some of that capacity. And, and, and as virtual school takes over, I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to change that I think are going to finally divert us away from needing to go out and find just big, massive pieces of land and build big, expensive schools with a bunch of overhead. Um, but again, right now we have we have some real needs because we've fallen behind over the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, we should we should be exploring alternate ways of how to finance schools through like a P3 or something, getting those in the ground, slightly larger schools. I don't want to build a 3,500 seat paint branch, but it's kind of ridiculous that we're building a 1,600 seat high school. There's plenty of room down there. We could probably have gotten more seats out of that high school. Um, we also have too many existing schools that are small that could add some capacity to them, could add some space to them. Um, but instead, we the school board and the school system still looks at school construction like they did in the 80s and 90s. And we've talked about the need for land for commercial growth. Imagine finding a 50 acre parcel you know, and dropping a school on it. It's just, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. So we're not hearing anything innovative, new um, on, on how to handle the capital budget um, really out of the school system. And it's, it's, it's been frustrating. And, and so with that, we, you know, we're going to go back and it's still related to schools, but we got to bring up because we've got a new school coming on board. 
And so, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the APFO process. And one of the things that normally happens with APFO is that you adopt charts each year um, in June or July. And, and in this case, you know, we have a new high school opening, which, excuse me, let me stop that, you know, which is rare. Um, but so, like we said here, you know, normally the process, you adopt charts each year in June or July, you know, as a high school, new high school is rare. And depending on the scenario, we have major changes to the open and close chart that will be needed. The process is outlined with community input. So the process that we typically have, you know, involves community input, which may ultimately delay the Board of Ed decision from a redistricting standpoint until maybe December. So ultimately, would you re would you support revisiting the open and close chart? as soon as the redistricting plan for 2023 is adopted by the Board of Ed, rather than waiting until July of 2023 as our, you know, traditional custom. So, David. Is this me, Leonardo? Yes, yes. I lost me. track. I'm sorry. Um, you know, we just had this public discussion, what, about a month ago. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm all for revisiting things when you have new information or better information. I think it's ridiculous that we do the APFO chart where the actual numbers that were used to create the projections are like a year and a half old. I remember Jen Terraza calling that out five years ago, and we still haven't haven't managed to get it changed. Um, so I... I I don't mind taking another look. I voted against deferring changing the chart or adopting the new chart last month because it seemed counterintuitive to wait for new information, but to continue for six months to use the oldest information we had. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think you, I think everyone has seen that I'm always open to have us have a discussion. I may ultimately vote against something but I don't like ever saying I'm not willing to discuss it. I'm not willing to consider. I'm not willing to hear both sides. So I guess the short answer is um, I would support revisiting it. Doesn't mean I'm going to support changing it. Um, and just for, for the watching public, the county council has never reduced the school surcharge. When it was created, it was created with a CPI increase or, or a CPI um, adjustment and that sort of gradually meandered up and then it was in 2019 that we did the big 400 and some percent increase in it and my amendment actually did what what Joan talked about a little bit ago was in the first few years phased it in so we hopefully wouldn't shock the market um you know but ultimately to pay for that phase in it's its stabilized number, which I think it gets to next year, is now higher than the original bill even was. So it's, it's in the $7 per square foot. And I see that where people are trying to build one house for their family and the, the school surcharge is 40,000 bucks, but you know they're gonna send kids to school. So that's, that's the intention of that school surcharge. Hopefully we're using the money that it creates wisely. Thank you, David. Joe? So you're asking if I would support um, yeah. the yeah basically yeah revisiting the closed chart as soon as the redistricting process is 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 adopted as opposed to waiting until July of next year which ultimately would give a little bit more time in terms of whether that's um, deliberation fact finding what have you right. Well, I think any um, change to a project timeline can be disruptive to scheduled dependencies and relationships. Um, so before changing the timeline, I'd want to identify the dependencies and the stakeholders in the project, consult with them, talk with other council members, and to weigh the benefits and risks of not sticking with July. For example, I'd wanna know not only about the change of this one high school, but um, of the nearby middle and elementary schools. So I, I would have to get more information and I, I can't say, oh yes, I would do this or not. I think it, it, there's a lot of um, factors to consider. And, and so we're gonna uh, have two more questions. Uh, the first is gonna be transportation related before 
well, I should say maybe a question and a statement. So the, the, we have one question that's going to be related to transportation. And then after that, I'll allow both of the candidates kind of a, a closing comment. And so, you know, we've had a lot of conversations around the, our roads and, and uh, transportation and, and so forth. And, and in many respects, some of its inadequacies. And so what would be your top priorities for transit, transportation, infrastructure, and public facilities investment in the county? Um, yeah, the traffic is, is terrible in the county. Um, the widening of Route 108 is spilling over into the backyards of residents. Um, the cost of living in Howard County has many employees that work here commuting from other counties. So we have congestion and the need for costly uh, road improvements. Um, we could s try to reduce traffic, making walkable communities and having residential properties um, that, that are uh, closer to the amenities that people need to live. But it's also important that Howard County is not an island. We depend on transportation connections with other um, counties, and these include state roads and federally funded interstate. So we need to collaborate with the neighboring counties and the federal authorities that will be. And we need to prioritize what roads we want. We have to define which ones we want, uh, which ones we should have, could have, and ones that you know we would like. We have to put together um, timelines and budgets and risks and costs. And this is um, hugely important. I definitely agree there's a traffic problem. Thank you, David. So I think transit and, and, and the walkable community like a live workplace like downtown Columbia can kind of nibble at the edges of this. But the reality is when, when people move to the suburbs or rural areas, they they still expect to drive to work. Um, I, I you know I I would prefer to see the investment go into our roads. Route seventy, Route twenty nine desperately need widening. Route ninety nine needs safety improvements because all the people that are getting off Route seventy because it's crowded around Route ninety nine. It's never made for that. I appreciated government Governor Hogan finally redirecting transit dollars away from PG and Montgomery County transit projects fixing our bridges and roads and giving us that road capacity as far as howard county's you know investment in that um look we made a small investment in route 32 and i you know i think we did our part but most of the people on our roads here are driving through they're commuting through howard county they live somewhere else and they work somewhere else and i certainly don't want to see us take money away from the things that our residents need um you know to bail the state out on these road improvements that they they need to make um you know some some transit sort of within columbia or, or maybe from maple on out to the region where we have the density to support it you know i'm all for that but to heavily subsidize transit to places where we don't really have enough people that want to use it i think it's a waste of money and with that, we are going to get ready to uh, wrap up. And so, um, David, since you went uh, last uh, when we opened, you'll go first this time. And ultimately, as as we as we close, um, and, and in your closing statement, um, so it's four years from now, and you know, let's say you've been reelected. What would you envision to be your most significant accomplishment over these? over the last four years if you know go forward and look backwards um i uh, i i think my most significant accomplishment um is is helping to kill the massive increase in recordation tax that would have been a body blow to commercial development jobs and private investment in howard county I thought we had that transfer tax increase beat too, but we ended up with a compromise. Um, you know, I again, I think that, that that is the next generation of how we pay our bills here. Um, you know, I, I, I 
I, I've consistently also on things you saw with minimum wage and plastics and things have tried to bring kind of this extreme policy back to the middle so that we balance the needs of the environment and residents and businesses knowing that we're all kind of intertwined here um you know to, to have a successful community i mean a community or a society or a village needs that strong balance of great jobs and safe neighborhoods and enough strategic and well-planned growth to sustain services um we have fallen into that trap of relying on residential development because and it was created by people long before us and it's hard to get off that merry-go-round but you know i think that finding other ways to grow um keeping a strong lid on spending is the only way for us to sort of you know get into what what is sort of the next the next phase of of the maturing howard county excellent thank you and so joan as you wrap up so if you're elected again four years from now you're looking back over your first term. What would you envision being some of your most significant accomplishments? Yeah, well, I hope um, to steer Howard County towards sustainability. And by that, I mean the intersection of a great economy, supporting our residents and supporting the environment. Um, representing District 5, the Rural West, I'll work for the preservation of agricultural land and stronger farms and agribusiness, stronger protections of forests, watersheds, natural areas, and strengthening the adequate public facilities ordinance to ensure that schools, roads, and other infrastructure cap catches up with the development that's already occurred. Moving forward, we need APFO not only to include roads and schools, but also, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> hospitals and utilities, police and fire. Next year, the Howard County will update um, the general plan. There's uh, resident interviews in um, Howard County by design document indicating we want unique foods and shopping rather than the franchises that are coming into the sprawling areas such as uh, Route 40 and Route 1. We want independent movie theaters and walkable neighborhoods. We need diverse housing options in each community so that each neighborhood doesn't become um, economically segregated from other ones. We need economical housing for students and seniors or for anyone who wants to minimize their housing cost. The community, um, the county's decisions has to reflect these, these wants. So by preserving open spaces and great neighborhoods, uh, Howard County will continue to be a place that business owners want to come, invest, and live. Thank you. And, and so, again, I want to thank both Joan and David for sharing their morning with us and sharing their thoughts uh, as it relates to um, how they would lead the county from a county council perspective. And so, again, um, again, thank you and wish the both of you uh, luck in your respective campaigns and we'll just share with you the next coffee and candidates will be in a few weeks will actually be on a friday uh september 16th and we're going to actually stay west and we're going to have a general assembly conversation with the candidates from 9a and so we'll have with us uh dr chow Wu. we'll have janine zing um uh, current delegate trent kittleman and Natalie Ziegler. And so that should be a great conversation there. And so uh, join us again, either on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. Thank you again, you both, Joan and, and David. And uh, hope everyone in Howard County has a great rest of your day. Thank you, Thank you Leonardo. Bye. Bye, Joan. Thanks so much. See you.